Good okay, morning, Joe. Good morning, Scott. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm uh, okay. We're joined this morning uh, by Jesus Rodriguez uh, from Caracas. Um, he is the former Consul General of Venezuela in Chicago, um, now back in Venezuela, and is uh, where he's the editor of the Orinoco Tribune. Um, he's joining us this morning, again, from Caracas to talk about the uh, coup attempt and the resistance uh, to it in uh, Venezuela. Welcome, Jesus. How are you guys? Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to to talk to you and to do things with you. Well, thank thank you so much. Um, so, just a, a little bit of kind of background first. Um, one of the terms that comes up a lot in in discussions of Venezuela is the the Bolivarian Revolution. Um, what what does that mean, and, and what is especially does this term Bolivarian uh, refer to? That's that's a big question. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, Bolivar is our hero. Bolivar was a rich Venezuelan in the, that was born in the 18th century, and 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 uh, and they the, the, his family owned most of, like a big chunk of Venezuela. But besides that, he decided that he was not uh, he didn't agree with the ruling of the Spaniards over Venezuela, and he spent the rest of his life uh, battling against them, and finally he expelled them around uh, 1821, uh, if you ask me. And since then, he has been a, the great example for Venezuelans, and he, he didn't only liberate uh, Venezuela, but also uh, expelled the Spaniards out of Colombia, Panama, Peru, Ecuador, and we didn't annex them, and we didn't try to occupy those countries or whatever. We just want to liberate, and, and actually Bolivar's plan was to create a big country, uh, uh, what, uh, and the name of that country was Colombia. So uh, Bolivar is an inspiration. It's an anti-imperialist inspiration, because Bolivar, even at that time, was very anti-imperialistic. One of the most famous... Uh, uh, phrases of him was uh, Estados Unidos está asignado por la providencia para propagar América Latina de, de, de miseria en nombre de la libertad. I'm going to translate it somehow. The U.S. is uh, appointed by God to uh, plague Latin America of poverty and misery in the name of liberty. That's <laughs> one of the things he said <laughs> wow. in the early 19th century. So you can imagine uh, what we are talking about here. So that's to give you a, a very brief insight about what Bolivarianism is. And what happened is that Chavez bring those ideas alive. And those ideas were kind of uh, underground for a, for, for a lot of time. And Chavez bring those ideas alive, and I believe that one of the one, that is one of the best things that Chavez did, among others, of course. So this the idea of, of, of national sovereignty then is, is central to um, yes to the project. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and anti-imperialist. Um, and and uh, so what um, what were some of the gains? Uh, that the the Bolivarian Revolution made um, in in terms of the you know the everyday life of the Venezuelan people. Um, That's a good question, especially because in recent years we have been experiencing a lot of economic distress caused by U.S. sanctions, mostly. Uh, uh, and 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 because of that, people sometimes tend to forget all the good things that happened before 2014 or 2013. You know, when we say that the economic war started, I mean, the U.S. aggression, the U.S. sanctions. So uh, just to summarize, uh, I, I could tell you that, uh, that Chavez, one of the big things that did was to bring dignity to the Venezuelans. There's an echo somewhere around there. Uh, Chavez wrote dignity for Venezuelans, especially for those ones that didn't belong to the elite, that didn't belong to the wealthy class. Uh, he 
brought dignity to them and they felt recognized by the government. And that scene is still alive, even though we are passing through, passing through these difficult times, uh, that spirit is there. Uh, that's one of the best things uh, that Chavez did. Uh, he and that, he that dignity. For the, what? The, that dignity, it also had a, a political form, right? There were the, the communal councils and, and new of ways course, for people of to of organize. That's and, what and, I was about to say. Yes, we had a, a social programs like uh, uh, Mission Robinson, uh, which uh, provide uh, which, with the help of Cuban, helped uh, eradicate illiteracy in Venezuela. We had Mission Barde Adentro that provided, with the help of Cubans, also provided doctors for free and medicine for free in the poorest shanty towns in the country. We had Mission Vivienda, which has been already, uh, even uh, in these current economic circumstances, we have reached a few weeks ago the house two million and a half. So just to give you an idea of the wow. advances of the revolution, even though uh, 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 we are right now in the middle of this economical crisis, but also right now in the middle of this uh, aggression from the U.S. and other countries. So that's hey, to give you, can you talk to us a little bit about the economic crisis. What is the cause of it? Is, is it that Venezuela is too dependent on oil revenue? Is it because of interference from the U.S. government? What's the source of it? I believe that it's a mix of a lot of factors. I believe that the, that, that the dependency on oil is still there, even though the government invested uh, a lot in trying to diversify the economy, the, the oil dependency is there. And I believe that some economists and historians in Venezuela have said for decades that that's the curse of oil. Uh, and that doesn't happen only in Venezuela. Even in those Middle Eastern countries that they show, the media show like examples of good, of good economic success or whatever. I mean, you disregarding the, the publicity, you know that they are still dependent on oil. Uh, so uh, it's a course. We have been trying to uh, to fix that, but it's not easy. Uh, but the, the economic crisis is also a, a, a consequence of U.S. sanctions that didn't start with President Trump. They started with, I mean, they started with, with President Obama. So, so uh, the, when Obama uh, the, approved a decree uh, saying that we were Venezuela was uh, unusual and extraordinary security threat to the U.S., that's when everything started. I'm talking about 2014. So there were economic, financial sanctions, uh, and, and it's important to highlight that sometimes there are not sanctions. I mean, there's no necessity of sanctions. When you talk about economy, uh, the economic actors, when they feel that they might be, they might be uh, prosecuted, that they might be sanctioned, fined, or whatever by the U.S. government, they act differently with you. I'm talking, in this case, with Venezuela. So since then, since 2014, a lot of things start to work bad in economic terms, especially in the international financial area. And of course, that had an effect on, on us. And uh, if you ask me, uh, one of the biggest effects of that is the decrease in the pro oil production that a lot of people uh, blame on Maduro. But if you ask me, I believe that is very connected to the U.S. sanctions. So uh, a lot of media talk a lot about how bad is the management of Maduro in terms that the oil production of the country is like right now uh, going down, but the truth is that that happened because you need investment. You need financial assistance when you are talking about producing oil. And when right. you are being uh, blockaded from the U.S. and from the European countries, uh, that makes your work in terms of oil production uh, harder. So uh, that's part of the problem. I, 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 I'm, I'm very Chavista. I'm very supportive of Maduro. But I have to say also that I believe that there were also a lot of economic decisions that were wrong or were not well implemented. So if you ask me, I believe that we have, as, as government, 
uh, even though I'm right now not in the government, we have committed mistakes also. But I believe that the mistakes happen everywhere mm -hmm. uh, uh, in any government. But if you uh, add to the mistake, U.S. sanctions, if you of add course. to the, the mistakes, uh, economic war, if you add to the mistake, all dependency, if you add to the mistake, a lot of other factors, uh, and including the ones connected to the economic internal factors within Venezuela that are also part of the problem because they play the game of the U.S. So, so you see uh, the situation that we are facing right now in economic terms. And, 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 that's and a also, very it seems to, to fuel a, a propaganda campaign. There's this this idea that's oh. spread in the United States. Uh, Socialism has failed. Socialism has failed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. Exactly. you have to keep the pressure on and, and force anybody on a socialist path to fail so you can point the finger and say, ah, see, there's no choice but capitalism. Yeah. I was reading something. Uh, I, I don't know. It was this one Latin American intellectual that says something like this. I'm going to try to paraphrase it. Uh, what happened in Venezuela, he said, is, uh, and the U.S. is very similar to the situation in which uh, an assassin is about to strangle you and he is blaming you that you are about to die because you don't know how to breathe. <laughs> and that's excellent. That's the perfect, uh, you know, analogy to what is happening in Venezuela. I mean, the U.S. is trying to strangle in us, economically talking, and maybe, I hope not, militarily. Uh, 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 and doing that, he's saying that he's about to kill us because we don't know how to breathe. <laughs> so that yeah, kind of it sums it up. Um, yes. so can you tell us a, um, a little bit about the, uh, the man who's, who, who the Trump regime appointed interim president, uh, Juan Guaido? Um, yeah. Where is he from? What's his background? What's his party? He belongs to Voluntad Popular. That's the most radical right-wing party in Venezuela. He was like forced in line. I mean, uh, in that party, the most uh, recognizable leaders, if you can call them that, are Leopoldo Lopez, that is in house arrest for a few years, uh, uh, Julio Borges, which is currently in Colombia because he's accused of, of being involved in the drone assassination attempt of President Maduro last August. Uh, and you have another one that was the third in line, and Guaido was the fourth in line, according to something that I read uh, a few days ago. Uh, so, could you uh, uh, tell And they tried to... to to middle to upper middle class and they needed someone that connect a little bit darker that connect with Venezuelan masses and with the Chavistas and, and that's part of, I mean everything besides uh, the appearance of Guaido is not casual. Everything has been manufactured in media laboratories from the US and in Venezuela. So they, 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 they prepare this. And some people, I believe, around there are saying that this guy, no, that this guy is socialist, that he is social democrat or whatever, which is not true. I mean, that guy is a right winger. And you can see photos of him kicking a, a policewoman a few years ago in a demonstration or showing his back in another demonstration a few years ago. And, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very right-wing actor with not too much. I mean, people, I didn't know that that guy exists until four, two or three months ago. Really? I mean, I, I yes, because he was he was before that mayor of La Guaira. Mm -hmm. And some people say that he did a night job there. La Guaira is a, like a satellite, like a suburb of a Caracas. Like, uh, and and then he he was elected as as the deputy for the uh, national assembly, the one uh, that was uh, won by the right wingers in 2015, and and since then no one talk about him. Hmm. Um, and on the on the question of elections, uh, you know, there, there's been 
a lot of, I think a, a lot of propaganda in the United States, you know, saying that the, uh, the most recent uh, elections were unfair. Um, and the story that doesn't get out is that several right-wing parties refused to participate in the elections, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Tell us about what, what are some of the kinds of, um, tell, how, how are, ele- what is electoral participation, electoral security like in Venezuela? I've heard it's very, it's very strong in terms of electoral yes, of course. Yes, and, and I truly believe that uh, with Chavez, we built one of the most robust electoral system in the world. I can tell you that with some sort of certainty because as Consul General of Venezuela in Chicago, I was able to interact with other consuls from at least from other Latin American countries in Chicago. And, uh, and uh, my experience comparing what we had with what other countries, at least other Latin American countries have, is, I mean, shows that we are way far uh, beyond uh, what is normal in electoral process. I mean, uh, the electoral process in Venezuela, in the electoral process in Venezuela, participate, all the political parties running, participate in 18 different audits that occurred before, during, and after the election. I'm talking wow. about 18 different audits in which each party, I'm not talking about Chavista parties, I'm talking about each party, live, left wing and right wing, uh, that are participating in that race, have a say uh, to, uh, on what happened in those audits. And if, you, if they complain about that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there's going to be a problem. We cannot pass to the next level. So that's to give you an idea. We also implemented something that I believe that is unique, which is the scanning of the fingerprint. When you are going to vote, a, a, a machine scans your fingerprint to avoid one, vo- one uh, voter multiple votes. You know what? That, that, that happened everywhere. That happened even in the U.S. Uh, and, and we applied, we initialized that uh, uh, during Chavez government. I believe that in 2002 or 2003. And that's great because that gives you certainty that no one will vote, I mean, more than once. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, we... Uh, the, the counting of the votes is public. Everyone in every electoral board, in every electoral chair, uh, even from the opposition parties uh, and from electoral, I mean, voters that want to participate in the counting, they can be there. It's not forbidden. It's public. It's a public act. And also, uh, the, a few, I mean, one or two days after each election, you can see the results of each electoral chair, electoral board, uh, in uh, the website of the electoral council. Okay? So, so you can compare what you see, what you saw in the counting of your electoral board with what is published by the, uh, you know, the, the Consejo Nacional Electoral, the Electoral National Council. So, I mean, there are, like, multiple ways wow. that shows you uh, that it's very complicated to to bypass or to trick that electoral system. So, it, it sounds so like... Yeah. Oh, no, uh, please, finish. No, 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 yeah, I, I just want to go back to the to, to the elections of, of, of for the national assembly uh, for the maduro last may and basically those parties that that, that uh, refuse to participate are the parties that are playing the game of the u.s uh, those are the parties that that uh, didn't want to sign an agreement that was about to sign last february I mean, i'm talking about february or uh, or i believe that is february or march last year that we we had like weeks of negotiations in Dominican Republic and we were about to sign an agreement and they decided not to not to sign it because at the last minute there is some people that say that they received a call from Washington that uh, told them not to sign that agreement 
But one of the things that was set up uh, in that agreement was the call for early presidential elections. And what Maduro did after not having that agreement signed was, you know, he said, well, uh, these guys didn't want to sign that agreement, but I'm going to release some political, uh, what they call political prisoners that are basically uh, criminal, uh, criminal, political criminals in jail. Uh, but he released some of them <laughs> and he called for early elections. And then they start crying. They start, they start saying that they didn't want early elections, even though they were <laughs> asking for those elections for more than two years. So uh, disregarding that uh, the main uh, right-wing political parties in Venezuela opposed those elections, uh, the... Some parties from that grouping of, le- of right-wing parties decided to participate, and, and that's when uh, Henry Falcón, a candidate from the right-wingers, decided to join the race. So in that race, wa- that race was not a race of only uh, Maduro running with himself. I mean, in that race, there were like six or uh, five uh, political, I mean, presidential candidates, and... Uh, and uh, they were two that that gained more than well, around around or more than one million votes. I mean, I believe I believe that the third one got something around one million, a little bit less. Uh, Henry Falcon had a little bit uh, close to uh, one point nine million votes, and Maduro have like six million votes. And, and if you compare that, uh, uh, are we still alive? Uh, well, I think okay. If you compare that with uh, the with what is happening and and uh, I'm sorry, I believe that I have a problem with my video, but yeah, I'm no. back. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, so, but yes, ask your question. Oh, uh, so yeah, I, I, I just like, I think it's um uh drawing close to um. Time to end the, the show here, but I just so it, it okay. sounds like the you know this was very clearly um, you know a, a, an incredibly undemocratic uh, attack on Venezuela on the Venezuelan people. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about how how people are responding there? We you know the images we see in the United States are all um, anti Maduro protesters. Uh, That's a lie. <laughs> so yeah, yes, what, what, I mean, what's it like? Yes, it's like. Uh, uh, let me tell you. Uh, last, uh, I believe that it was Wednesday, the twenty third. Mm-hmm. There were two demonstrations, two Chavistas demonstration. I mean, one Chavista demonstration and one uh, from the right uh, from the right winger. Uh, those demonstrations were massive. I believe that the the right wingers mo- uh, managed to to mobilize a few quiet people. And the Chavistas also managed to mobilize a few white people. I believe that the numbers of each demonstration were very similar, if you ask me, to be, being very objective. <coughs> but uh, they didn't... Uh, and the days after that, they have been trying to create with criminal bands uh, some sort of uh, violent uh, guarimbas, as we call it, like protests in Tom Street in Venezuela. But it's more than evident that those things have didn't have the effect that they want. They wanted to create some confrontation because they this time they did that in 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 in, in working class neighborhoods, uh, and they create some some you know uh, situations of violence. But that didn't escalate. And meanwhile, the government has been asking the the masses, the Chavista masses, to mobilize, and we have been moving more than and actually. Uh, yesterday, there, or before yesterday, there was this demonstration called by the right winger that didn't manage to. I mean, they didn't have more than five thousand people there. I believe mm. that that, that uh, being uh, very optimistic and be, being being very generous, with it, they don't mobilize too much. And the spirit among chavistas is going up because in the in front of the aggression, in the evidence of the U.S. direction of all of this, the Chavista people got indignated and more, you know, with more energy to try to, you know, uh, 
defend the country because right now we are seeing that there's a big chance of you know us being invaded. So that's to give you a very quick outlook about what's happening. And tomorrow we're going to have a demonstration. I believe that the right wingers also are having a demonstration. But I believe that the Chavista demonstration that is going to happen tomorrow in Avenida Bolivar in Caracas is going to be massive. If you ask me. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much uh, again, Jesus Rodriguez, uh, for for joining us. Um, no, uh, we are we we send you our our solidarity to you and to the people of Venezuela um, with the the struggle for uh, the Bolivarian Revolution and the struggle against imperialism. Um, and uh, yes, uh, thank you again. No, thank you, guys, and thank you, thank the U.S. for the solidarity. I mean, we have been seeing a lot of solidarity from the U.S. in recent days, and we need more. And we are always welcome to 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 talk with you, and, and you know that we enjoy uh, doing things with you guys. So, so whatever you need, just ask, and we will be there. Excellent. Please, please go to our website at www.cpusa.org. We have a petition there that says hands off Venezuela. We're calling on the Trump administration and our elected officials to refuse to allow Mr. Trump to intervene militarily uh, and to support the elected government of the Venezuelan people. You can also go to our Facebook page and you'll find other action items related to Venezuela. So, Jesus, thank you very much. Scott, thank you. Thank you, thank you Joe. Yeah, um, bye bye guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.